It's another beautiful edition of the program, The Eagle. My name is Aisha Gamberi. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. Presenting the program with me is Aisha Mohammed. Hello, Aisha. Hi, Aisha. How are you? I'm fine. Hello, viewers, and welcome to the program. <laughs> FCC will get you anywhere, anytime. On the program today is the arrest of a notorious impersonator of EFCC officials, Kunle Adeshola. Despite the commission's warning against imposters and the continuous arrest of the perpetrators of this criminal act, it is amazing that some of those people remained undeterred. Also, as part of the EFCC's media outreach, the Commission organized a one-day capacity building workshop for media practitioners in Abuja and Lagos. Executive Chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Ibrahim Lamuri, has charged media practitioners in the country to take up the challenge of fighting economic and financial crimes in Nigeria through investigative journalism. Lamuri gave the charge in his opening remarks at a one-day capacity building workshop for media practitioners with a team reporting economic crimes organized by EFCC at Dennis Hotel, Abuja. While thanking the media for being an ally, Lamuri, however, regretted recent negative profiling of the commission by a section of the media. He said the notion that the commission is selective in investigating persons suspected of committing economic and financial crimes is rather unfortunate. The EFCC boss lamented that despite evidence to the contrary, these negative stereotypes continue to thrive. Nevertheless, there are issues in the media confining of the EFCC that is less than desirable. And I think we need your help to, to, to correct that. The notion for instance that the commission is selective in its investigating persons suspected of committing economic crimes and that only those who have fallen out of favor of the powers that be are touched by the commission. That the commission has gone to see, uh, unfortunately, the creation of the media. Even in the midst of contrary evidence, a section of the press have been so swayed by this stereotype that they are willing to shift their gaze. Lamuri said corruption threatens all sections, including the media. He said, the media is suspected to learn its investigative skill in helping the EFCC fight corruption and not allow itself to be sucked in by the corrupt. In a paper titled, Financial and Economic Crimes Reporting, Separating Facts from Fiction, Martins Oloja, editor of the Guardian newspaper, called on journalists to report the truth at all times. We have a standard code in which all journalism unions all over the world adopt the same thing. And there is no place for fiction. There is a place all the time for fact. And that is why there is uh, the screen that facts are sacred. In fact, they say opinion is free, but facts, we don't in journalism. Whether yesterday or today or forever, journalism will still be guided by facts. Anything that is different from fact is not part of journalism. And fiction writers who, who are award winners that have applied to work as journalists have to undergo some training so that they don't write fiction. Azubuke Ishekwene, the group managing director of Leadership Newspaper, who also presented a paper entitled Ethical Journalism and Reporting Economic and financial crimes. Realities, challenges, and ideals stated that accuracy, fairness, objectivity, impartiality, and public accountability are some of the guiding principles journalists must adhere to in the discharge of their duties. As professionals, if we really want to call ourselves professionals, there are certain rules of conduct, the rules of the game, to use the crisis phrase, conduct and norms of behavior that are expected of us. 
And some of these basic guiding principles in the practice of our profession, and you can apply it to financial crime as much as you can apply it to any other thing. Uh, that one, we should be fair. These are just basic common principles that most people are doing. That reporting should be fair. It should be fair in your reporting. Whether it's the reporting of financial crime, or the suspect involved in financial crime, or it's the report of uh, whether you are reporting what is happening in the stock market. That reporting should be fair. That reporting should be accurate. That reporting should be objective. That reporting should be impartial. That reporting should be balanced. Another facilitator at the workshop, Haji Asani of The Voice of Nigeria, also urged the participants to be abreast of the new technology-driven tools for news gathering and verification. Form of internet activity to another. The concepts of global village, like as you said, and like uh, <clears throat> Martin said before him, one unified world, a heartbeat away. These are all concepts, what they are today, are uh, reality. But for what purpose? Existing literature has shown that the internet avails us the opportunity to do virtually everything. I think I started at that point. Why was it important to stress that and why am I still saying it now? Because anything that a human being can possibly conceive, theoretically, whether it's cooking, whether it's sports, whether it's riding a bike, everything, Tons of tool sites are, are available on the internet to talk to you about it, to teach it to you, to show it to you, to archive it, to exchange it. And that's where your new tool, all of you being here, to exploit that new tool collectively to your own benefit. Also speaking, Dele Agekame, publisher of Capital Magazine, Examine stereotypes and investigative journalism. When I was coming at the airport, I bought some papers, about six or seven of them, because I buy papers every day, but I had them at home because my wife and children, they read them, so I left them, I bought other set of papers. When I was reading through the paper, very popular paper, uh, for those who want to go and cross check, it's not for any purpose, but I was going through this day. There was a particular story here about three places. I started reading Vanguard Land. Vanguard was told inside his day. Three times I went back to look at the paper. I said, this is his day, it's not Vanguard. I am telling you, Vanguard Land, our reporter in Vanguard was told. And I was reading this day. I was, I was amazed. You see, that is the end of this territory we are talking about. Maybe somebody, a lazy journalist somewhere, just left there. Is. That is stupid, there's some editor. A news editor that didn't want to do his job. And then they just planted the story there. How can you read this there? I mean, read it, Vanguard Lands. You understand? That is it's, it's, it's a shame. Participants at the one day workshop were drawn from the print, electronic, and social media. The second leg of the workshop also took place in Lagos for journalists covering the southwest region. I am Zainab Sani Ahmed. Nigeria is the sixth largest producer of oil in the world. In over 50 years of oil exploration, the country has earned well over $600 billion as oil revenue. If properly managed, it should provide us with a health system that will save lives and not a decaying health system. A society where energy goes round for meaningful development and not an epileptic power supply system. A productive educational system and not a decaying educational system. A society where jobs are created for self-sustainability and not a society where our youth roam the streets unemployed. A highway of safety and security and not roads that lead us to early graves. We should have credible leaders who deliver dividends of democracy to the people and not corrupt leaders who divert our collective revenue for private use. Say no to corrupt leaders. This message is from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. The saying that all day is for the thief and a day for the honor 
is what best describes the plight of Kunle Adeshola, who is facing persecution for allegedly parading himself as an assistant commissioner of police attached to the EFCC and using same to defraud unsuspecting heads of government agencies. He was said to have penetrated the office of the Director General of the Nigerian Tourism Development Corporation, NTDC, claiming he was assigned to discreetly investigate staff of the corporation. He, however, met his Waterloo when he purportedly sought approval for secondment to the NTDC and to travel with staff of the corporation on a foreign trip. Adeshola, who was discovered to be a notorious imposter, had at other times claimed to possess a doctorate degree in criminology from the University of Jos. Upon his arrest, a search carried out by the EFCC operatives in his apartment in Lugwe, Abuja, yielded documents that include a fake EFCC ID card, fake police ID card, forged NYSC and University of Jos certificates. The suspect was arraigned before Justice Hussein Baba of the FCT High Court, Meitama Abuja, on a seven-count charge bordering on impersonation, forgery, and obtaining under false pretense. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, was established as one of the mechanisms to combat economic and financial crimes through prevention, investigation, and prosecution. The act establishing the commission was first enacted in 2002 and later repealed and replaced with 2004 Act, which gives the commission more enforcement powers. The commission also exists to investigate all financial crimes including advanced fee fraud, money laundering, counterfeiting, illegal charge transfers, future market fraud, fraudulent encashment of negotiable instruments, credit card fraud, contract scams, and many others. Its powers also include the adoption of measures to identify, freeze, confiscate, or seize proceeds derived from terrorist activities, economic and financial crimes related offenses. The birth of the EFCC marks a turning point in the fight against economic and financial crimes and corruption. The country was held hostage by this element that specialized in defrauding unsuspecting victims of their fortunes under false pretenses. They are referred to as advanced fee frosters, popularly known as 419 in the Nigerian parlance. With the establishment of the EFCC, however, a war was waged against them by the Commission. Many of them were arrested, prosecuted, and convicted. Properties and cash worth billions of nairas were recovered from them, and today, a large number of them are still languishing in various prisons across the country. The very first case of advanced fee fraud that the Commission investigated was that of a syndicate of five fraudsters led by one Emmanuel Umudi, in which a Brazilian bank was swindled of 242 million US dollars. They were arrested and the funds were recovered and restituted to the bank in Brazil. Also part of the EFCC's efforts at bringing the activities of advanced fee fraudsters to an end was the clamped down on 419ers who duped unsuspecting victims through divination in shrines. Many of these criminals were involved in producing fake herbal medicines which they used in duping unsuspecting victims. A massive operation was launched in Ikorodu axis of Lagos State and some other parts of the southwest which led to the many suspects in their hideout. Among them was one Elente Apetutu, who is the leader of the syndicate. The commission also tackled cyber fraudsters known as Yahoo Yahoo in the Nigerian parlance. This set of cyber fraudsters, who are mostly young Nigerians, sends scam emails to unsuspecting victims mostly abroad with the intent to defraud in them. The commission regularly organizes raids at their flashpoints. One of such raids was the Operation Cyberstorm, which took the Commission's operatives round all cyber cafes in the country. Documents used by the scammers were intercepted by the EFCC. The Operation Cyberstorm led to the arrest and prosecution of many of these fraudsters. They were sentenced to various jail terms as the clampdown on them still continues. In areas where these raids are conducted, the Commission's operatives mostly face tensed situations. Hey, 
that make sure that anything I bring, you give them to me. My friend, go to that side. Go to that side. Government officials were not left out of the fight as the commission has successfully apprehended many of them who use public office to siphon government funds. Former state governors were not also left out. The establishing acts of the commission also vest powers in it to investigate tax evasion. The commission's operative raided a shopping outlet operated by Chinese nationals called Chinatown in Lagos. Importers at these markets have been variously accused of evading tax when bringing goods into the country. The man behind the whole fraud was one Jackson. He was arrested alongside some other culprits and brought to book by the EFCC. I'm an officer from the EFCC. Yeah. My EFCC? I don't know. Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. I don't know. What the... What the... Good. We have a um, uh, petition against your office. You know tax, tax, you are supposed to pay tax to yes, government? Yes, yes. Do you pay tax? I pay tax for Chinatown, Jackson. Okay, uh, what agency, who collects the tax from you? Jackson. Please, can I have some receipts from you? From, from... I have, but uh, I have, I check for you. I demand that I pay money. Yes. You want to know this? No, The ERCC weighed into the banking sector crisis in 2010. Depositors' funds, which were divided for private use by defaulting former bank chief executives, were recovered. The action led to the arrest and conviction of some of the former executives of the rescued banks. The commission secured the conviction of one of them, Cecilia Ibru, who was a former managing director in Oceanic Bank PLC, now known as Echo Bank PLC. Ibru served six months imprisonment with billions of naira recovered from her in cash and assets. Other inducted bank chiefs are currently being prosecuted in various courts across the country. Ten years after the establishment of the commission, it has successfully charged 700 cases to court and recorded over 500 convictions. Within the same period, the commission also recovered properties including cash, houses, land, luxury cars, vessels and oil tankers running into billions of dollars. Welcome back and thank you for staying tuned. Aisha, isn't it amazing? Despite the commission's warning against these imposters, I don't know, they just remained undeterred and exactly. they've refused to turn a new leaf. And if they choose to continue, the EFCC will not relent to nail them. They can only run, they can't hide. Sooner than later, the law will catch up with all of them. And as a reminder, the attention of the commission has been drawn to activities of some unscrupulous individuals who write fake invitation letters to unknown victims, claiming that such letters emanated from the EFCC. Take a look at these letters critically before you respond to them. This is an example of a letter sent by an impersonator of the EFCC using a fake EFCC letterhead. If you receive any letter inviting you to the commission, please report straight to any of our offices and not to any location mentioned on the letter. You can call this number scrolling to verify and ascertain it is from the EFCC before you respond. Next is the special focus segment. On the segment today, the Eagle team interviewed the former chairman of EFCC, Mrs. Farida Waziri. The report is presented by Carmen Lugay. Mrs. Farida Waziri was appointed in June 2008 by the late President Umaru Musa Radwa's administration. Waziri said working with the EFCC was not an easy task. I gave my best, I gave my all, I came out, and uh, as I said, it's like working the EFCC is like holding a tiger by the tail. If care is not taken, tiger will devour you because corruption is endemic. It's become a way of life, and uh, if you fight it, my predecessor used to repeat it all the time. Fight corruption, corruption, fight back. So you thank God to be out alive. With the media focus on you, some will say that you were more popular than the EFCC you led. What is your reaction to this? W would you say that is popularity? <laughs> I mean, if the papers were... Well, some papers were positive, but some, believe you me, 
I'll just be passing on the road and I'll see a soft cell. Many scandals of Farida was in it. She's done it again. This, you know, it was so much. So while fighting corruption for my father now, with my whole heart, body, and soul, there were some groups that were fighting me, and they made sure that they churned out false documentation about. So I would say I was fought locally, nationally, and internationally. There is this view that your predecessor, Nuhuribadu, radicalized the anti-corruption war, but when you came, you only glamorized it. Would that be correct? I think that is nonsense. I mean, I know when I got there, uh, I read Nubu's book where he started from nothing. Piece of paper, you're appointed. So he used his discretion to build from the scratch, from nothing to something. So he worked, you know. But if you talk about work, I don't know what you mean by glamour. Is it because I tie my head and wear my glasses? And uh, the, the things I wear, Paco, they say it's gold and diamond, but yeah, you know, someone who is presentable always look presentable. You know, so the big door that I was glamouring, I was doing this, you know. But the record is there, okay? Waziri said during her tenure as the EFCC boss, her major challenge was interference. My major challenge was interference. Um, it's, I, I, I came with my wealth of experience, but I think if I hadn't that experience, maybe I wouldn't you know, be sitting here. Uh, there are things I wouldn't want to you know, discuss, uh, but uh, it, 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 was, it was not the job that was difficult for me. It was the interferences. Interferences from where, ma? From which quarters? From everywhere. And what were your low and high points? My the low points came when they started to kill our operatives. I felt very bad. Uh, the, the team that went to court in the east and were ambushed. The sergeant, you know, even though he had a bulletproof, he, the man aimed at his head and shot him dead. The others were wounded. Some attempts on our operatives' lives, the killing of a expert, a forensic expert in the Kaduna, that was the turning point, the low point of, I, I felt, you know, I, I really felt very bad. And I thought, oh, so it has come to this, like Al Capone, you know, like a, a mafia thing. So that worried me, but the high points are many. Nigeria is the sixth largest producer of oil in the world. In over 50 years of oil exploration, the country has earned well over $600 billion as oil revenue. If properly managed, it should provide us with a health system that will save lives and not a decaying health system, a society where energy goes round for meaningful development and not an epileptic power supply system a productive educational system and not a decaying educational system. A society where jobs are created for self-sustainability and not a society where our youth roam the streets unemployed. A highway of safety and security and not roads that lead us to early graves. We should have credible leaders who deliver dividends of democracy to the people and not corrupt leaders who divert our collective revenue for private use. Say no to corrupt leaders. This message is from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. Well, that's it on our package of The Eagle. Do join us next week for another edition of the program. Remember, The Eagle is always watching you. Stay away from economic and financial crimes. From me, it's bye-bye for now, and God bless Nigeria. Thanks for watching. To be part of the program, you can send your suggestions and comments via our Twitter handle at Official EFCC or leave a comment on our Facebook page, Official EFCC forward slash Facebook.com. You can also watch EFCC activities via www.youtube.com forward slash Official EFCC. Have a good evening.